Films coordinator, and I'm here today with Cheryl, Robin, and Amy. So I'm going to go ahead and let them introduce themselves. So um, if you'll just want to say your name and pronouns and just talk a little bit about what you do. Um, Cheryl, do you want to start? Sure, happy to. Uh, my name is Cheryl Crooks, and I'm executive director of uh, Cascadia International Women's Film Festival, which we'll talk about. It's based here in Bellingham. And uh, my pronouns are she, her. Awesome. Uh, Robin, do you want to go? Sure. Hi, my name is Robin Cloud. I'm a writer and director based in LA, but hailing from Brooklyn, New York. And my pronouns are she, her, or they, them. All right. And Amy. Hi, my name is Amy Long. Uh, I'm a writer director. Uh, my pronouns are she, her. Awesome. So to start off, the reason that all three of y'all are kind of connected to each other is through Cascadia Film Festival. So I wanted to start off just having Cheryl explain a little bit about what Cascadia is and how it got started. Sure, happy to. Uh, we're just now entering our fifth season. This will be our first, uh, I mean, our fifth festival. Uh, we're opening May 13th and it runs for three, um, I'm sorry, runs for 10 days this year uh, online because of the pandemic. Uh, we um, organized uh, ourselves, well, actually more than uh, five years ago, uh, but we're uh, one of the few festivals in the United States that are solely dedicated to showcasing uh, the films uh, directed by women. And uh, it's, it's a, a niche festival for that reason, but it's important because um, there aren't that many women directors uh, still. The, the, it's, you know, the equity is, is not there in Hollywood. And we feel it's important that uh, you know, we let women's voices be heard through their films and showcase uh, the finest films we can find. And we've been very fortunate in finding some very good ones this year. Uh, and uh, 27 films and directors from everywhere and a lot of different films. So um, that's kind of what we're, what we're all about. We're based here in Bellingham, but it is an international film festival because we accept films and look for films from all over the world. And we have uh, uh, jurors that are based all over the world that help us find our short films in particular. But uh, we have a programmer in New York that helped us with our uh, uh, feature films this year. And we'll be online. Uh, usually we're at the Pickford Film Center in downtown Bellingham, but not this year. <laughs> So uh, maybe next year. Awesome. Yeah, so you said Cascadia only started about five years ago. It seems like the festival has grown a lot since then. It has. I mean, we've grown rapidly and our reputation has grown rapidly as well. And, and I think primarily the reason for that, well, there was a lot of planning that went into it prior to our launching the festival in, in uh, 2017. We actually kind of started to put things together in 2015. But uh, we took some time and, and thought about what we were doing. And then also we uh, have talked to a lot of festivals. We know a lot of um, festivals around the country and we belong to something called the Film Festival Alliance, which is a, you know, a, an association of, I think it's something like 600 film festivals. And that's been extremely helpful at, to getting us up and running a lot faster than uh, a lot of startup festivals would have been. We learned from a lot of people and had a lot of help from a lot of festivals around the country. It's been really, really super. And uh, we've just, and, and also we happen to have an enclave of people that live here in Bellingham that are quite extraordinary. Uh, one of our founding uh, board members, for example, founded the film program at the School of Visual Arts in New York. He <laughs> lives here now. And uh, one of the producers of the X-Files is on our uh, advisory board. Um, so th there's a lot of people like that here that are living here because they want to live here. Uh, they have had careers or work elsewhere, New York, Los Angeles, Vancouver, Toronto, wherever. Uh, so we've had the advantage of having, having them uh, on board with us from the very beginning to help us uh, you know, get in touch with people, but also uh, to 
ensure the quality level of the festival because we're we're very we're a very selective festival and um, we like that because we really do want to showcase what the most exceptional work we can find. Um, so we've been we've been fortunate that, that we've really grown rapidly and uh, not necessarily in the number of films, uh, but we are expanding that. But in, in terms of the support that we've we've uh, been received, not necessarily just in Bellingham, but across the country, and we've partnered with a lot of uh, film industry uh, organizations like the Alliance of Women Directors, uh, New York Women in Film and Television, um, trying to think who all else was women in media in Los Angeles, as, as well as um, uh, just individuals themselves who have really helped to you know get the festival off the ground uh, sooner than we you know might otherwise have been. We, we had we in fact we heard when we were at, at the Pickford like our second year or something like that. The audience people were leaving and who've gone to a lot of festivals. They said we look like a festival that had been in, uh, around for 10 years. So we really kind of got the jump on it. We're, pr we're proud of that. And, and we work hard to, you know, to uh, create a good festival. And we're especially, we work especially hard with our relationships with our filmmakers. Um, we maintain those as best we can, even after the festival, because we believe that part of the benefit of having a festival like us is is the networking and, and the, the mentorships that we can help create within uh, our, our alumni directors. We, once they're a director, I always say you're part of the family now. <laughs> so, you know, we, we can, put, I had a conversation just the other day with a, a director in, in New York and, and she was asking me, asking me for advice. And I'm saying, well, I'm, I'm not the one to give you the advice, but I can put you in touch with someone who can. So um, that's one of the things that we like to see come out of the festival and, and it ha has happened a lot. We've had some directors, the older directors, more experienced that have mentored younger directors. Uh, we've had directors receive funding from some of our donors as a result of the festival. So, and we've also had a lot of students, uh, especially Western students who have volunteered and helped with us interact with our directors and, and our boards. Uh, and they have gained uh, you know, a tremendous amount of insight um, and knowledge uh, about the industry and, and how uh, the film industry works. So that's all kind of part of what we're, we're trying to do here. Awesome. So Robin, your short film, $2, is in Cascadia's festival this year. So could you just talk a little bit more about uh, what that film is uh, and also how you got involved with Cascadia? Sure. Um, so $2 is a dark comedy about a person who hates their day job and <laughs> has to rebel against it in order to become free and pursue their dream. Um, it's a film inspired by my own experience of like trying to balance having money jobs just to support my life as an artist in New York for many, many years. Um, it's also made in part with the AFI Film Institute because I was I just finished the AFI's directing workshop for women um, where we have to complete a short uh, in our program which is a one-year program um, yeah and so I really wanted to make I love the movie Office Space which was an old classic and I really wanted to make like the black queer version of that um, <laughs> would just add some you know more contemporary issues to it <laughs> so that's where I sort of came up with the inspiration for it. Oh, in terms of Cascadia, I you know when you said, um, Cheryl, when you said that you were you were involved with AWD, which is Alliance for Women Directors, I think that's how I learned about your film festival through their their member bulletin, because they send out bulletins of film festivals that they recommend. And I'm always like, oh, sure. OK, great. This sounds great. <laughs> so I think that's how I found you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you mentioned that uh, AFI directing workshop for women. What was yeah. your experience like with that? Oh, it was incredible. It was a program that I really, really wanted to do um, because I know a lot of uh, women um, who have gone through the program and it really helped them to launch their careers as directors, both in film and television. Um, and I applied twice and I got in the second time. Uh, and I moved to LA sort of with the intention of I'm going to get in. And so I need to be in LA when I get in. And, and that's exactly what happened. And I just, I was just like so lucky and blessed. Um, it was in a wonderful program. Um, I learned so much. I mean, it's super 
intense because it's basically like two years of film school in one year. Um, but my cohort was incredible. We still have our writers group and we meet like once a month and we've done really well. Everyone's done really well this year. People have, you know, written uh, features and gotten deals for TV shows. And, you know, we really help each other move forward and, and stay focused on our work. So it's been great. Yeah, it sounds super interesting. <laughs> I was like, I want to play to that someday. <laughs> yeah, you should. And then Amy, you have a feature film in the festival, A Shot Through the Wall. So what, uh, so can you talk a little bit more about that movie, the inspiration behind it? And as a feature project, uh, how did you get that off the ground? Because that is something I think it feels very intimidating to me <laughs> at this point. Oh my God, <laughs> how much time do we have? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, this is my first feature. Uh, it's called A Shot Through the Wall. It's about an Asian American cop who killed an innocent black man in the projects in New York. So it was inspired by a true event that happened back in 2014. So I started writing this project um, somewhere around 2015 when the verdict came down for um, that particular um, case. And, um, and it, I found it really interesting because I went home for um, dinner once. So I'm from the Bay Area and um, I went home for dinner once. So what happened with this um, case was, uh, there was a, this was, this was um, the beginning of BLM. And um, it was really interesting because um, me as, or, me as Asian Americans were, were not really a part of this um, conversation. And I found it really interesting one weekend that I went home and um, my whole um, family was debating. So we were at this dinner table and my whole family was debating about this case where there was a cop in Brooklyn who was doing vertical patrol and in the pink housing uh, and um, he accidentally shot a an innocent black man who was coming up the stairs. And um, it was really interesting because he was the first um, cop that was indicted in 12 years in New York state. Mm -hmm. And um, so at that family dinner, um, half of my family was talking about how, um, how you know, enough is enough and um, justice needs to be um, brought to light. And then the other half was talking about how he was scapegoated as a cop. Um, and I thought it was really interesting to explore where I stand as Asian American in this spectrum of racism today in America. So yeah, I mean, I mean, right now it's 2021 and I really didn't think the film was still gonna be relevant now. And it, it's terrible that it still is and this is still in the news. And um, so yeah, so this is how sort of the film came about. Um, yeah, I mean, in terms of feature, um, I've been working for a little over a decade um, since I graduated film school at UCLA. And um, I was a commercial filmmaker and I, I made a lot of commercials after graduating school. And then, um, and there was a couple of, this is sort of my third take of, uh, of my first feature that I was trying to get off the ground. And that took, that took a little, over you know over almost 10 years and we shot this three years ago and um, it's just coming out now um, due to budget and everything else that comes along with it so yeah nice I hope that answers your question yeah definitely that's a lot of great information so Cheryl over the, the years that you've been doing Cascadia uh, have you, what kind of changes have you seen in the film industry when it comes to women directors? Because you mentioned that Cascadia is all about uplifting women directors. Do you feel like there have been more opportunities coming out for women directors mm. over the years? That's probably a better question for Robin and Amy than me, but um, I mean, I, I know statistics where we watch every year uh, there's an excellent study that is done by uh, 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 San Diego State. Uh, I can't think of the name of it right now, but they do it every year. And it tracks uh, the progress uh, that women make in the industry, you know, behind the camera and, and uh, in front of the camera. But, uh, and, and not just directors, but cinematographers and editors, why not? 
and and there have been i mean those percentages have gone up some but uh you know it's just it's so small still i think it's something like now up to maybe nine or twelve percent of the you know top grossing films and major films that the studios are doing uh are directed by women i mean you know that's not very much it's certainly better than if i think of something like started at 3.2 when we started looking at it in in 2015 so it is better and and at least from from an outsider's perspective with the festival uh you know what we see i mean like this year's academy awards for example i mean the first this was you know chloe sales uh received the best director so she was what the third woman to uh receive academy award as a director and first woman of color ever, you know, but um, suffice to say, there's plenty of work to be done. Um, you know, it, I mean, it, it's a tough industry to begin with and women have just, have never, ha haven't haven't received the, the equal uh, opportunities that they should have. I mean, oddly enough, in the 1920s, women dominated the industry as directors. I mean, uh, there were a couple of women that made 300 films, uh, um, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, Lois Weber for one. one. And, and uh, those films, what happened was when, when the industry transitioned from silent films to talkies and the studios came in, women kind of got squeezed out uh, and relegated to other positions if they wanted to stay in the industry. A lot of them went became editors because as directors, they you know knew what it took to put together a film. And so they migrated to the editor's spot, but they ended up you know getting stuck there basically. And um, because of the studio uh, system, the way it was, women were largely overlooked. There were women working, uh, Ida Lupino was one and, and Dorothy Azar is another one, but it was just so few and far between. So there have been strides made and especially independent film is, is, a, is a great place for women to get a foothold, uh, starting as a short filmmaker or often documentaries. We, we, have, we find with the festival, uh, we find a lot more documentaries directed by women than we do uh, you know, narrative features. It's, it's a lot tougher to find the narrative uh, features. And a lot of that has to do, I'm sure Amy can tell you, with, with financing uh, restrictions. I mean, you know, it's, it's tough. And um, so, you know, we just think that we, if we just, if we just keep at it, you know, and we keep giving recognition to the films that women make because they're really good films out there. And, and we're trying to increase the audience awareness, you know, of, of the situation uh, as, as well as the industry, you know, but um, if audiences are looking for it, then it, 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 um, the industry responds, <clears throat> you know. So um, at least that's the hope. Um, and, and there needs to be a lot more done in terms of uh, at the executive level uh, in the studios, uh, you know, and in independent producers and whatnot. I mean, uh, it's been a long time. I, I don't know now who's the heads of the different studios, but I remember I used to work for Time Magazine and I remember that when Sherry Lansing uh, you know, was appointed ahead of the studio. That was a cover story because it was just like had, hadn't been done before. And she, she didn't think it was so unusual. I, I saw an interview recently with her and she was saying, I couldn't understand what the big deal was, but it was a huge deal. And it, it still would be a big deal because they just don't, there's not that many women, you know, uh, calling the shots as, as you will say, uh, you know, in, in that position. I don't know, would you guys agree? You're more, you know, right there feeling the, than I am. Yeah, I'd love to know about both of your backgrounds, how you kind of got started in film and how you feel like things have evolved over the course of your career. Maybe, do you want to take it? Do you want me to go first? Go um, for it. <laughs> okay, so well, I studied film at Howard University way, way, way back when. Um, and then I worked in the business for a very, very short period before like totally switching fields and being like, I want to study architecture. And so I did that and then worked in architecture for 10 years in New York. Um, and then I started doing stand-up comedy. And in that process, writing, writing sketches and then 
eventually like directing short sketches and I was like oh I really like directing and then I wrote a short play that did well in a local like theater a queer like theater um, festival and I turned that into a short film and that was my first film that I made like in like 20 years um, and it just did really really well and sort of I, I got on set and I was like oh like this is everything like directing is everything um, it's all of the artistic things that I like to do, you know, because I was like in a band and I, like, you know, so you're like dealing with music and costumes and production design and, and making decisions and being in charge and all the things that I like. So um, I finally realized that directing was my thing. Um, and so then I just started pursuing it, you know, pretty doggedly and I've made a film every year since then. Um, and it seems to be working out. But in terms of the, the industry, yeah, I mean, the industry is totally, we've had this conversation before, Cheryl, in our other panel, it's just mm -hmm. like, you know, things need to change dramatically. Um, I always say that, you know, it's the gatekeepers that need to shift because they're the people that are opening the doors for us, for filmmakers like uh, Amy and myself. And um, yeah, it's that. And it's just giving opportunity. You know, it's very hard to get into episodic. You have to know someone you have to have shadowed when like a white dude can come and he's made maybe a two minute short and they're like oh yeah he's got it and they'll give him <laughs> an episode um but for us we have to prove ourselves if we're women of color even like more so you have to prove yourself so so much it's like almost absurd mm -hmm. um in order to do the thing that you know is what we already know how to do <laughs> so it takes sort of someone taking a chance on you in order to get an episode and then you can't get an episode unless you've kind of already done it so it's a very insane system um but eventually i i hope to break <laughs> into that um that's my goal for either this year or, or 2022 um yeah so we'll see what happens awesome and what about you amy i i think i've had very similar experiences uh <laughs> with episodics and things like that. It's very much of a game of chicken and eggs. And um, um, yeah, I came from a different background. I studied math in college, um, algorithm. I went into finance for a little bit um, and realized this is not exactly what I wanted to do. And um, I just happened to be on set. I did an internship at HBO and, and I just fell in love with it. Um, fell in love with being on set and just the energy and everything and and I, I mean growing up I didn't think this was an option um, growing up you have you know, as Asian American you have um, engineer math or you know very stereotypical um, I grew up in a family that's very stereotypically Asian American so um, yeah, and, um, and I love being on set and um, I got very lucky with the commercial. And then, um, and then I, I continued directing commercials, but um, every single one of them I have to, I think the first day or so I have to prove that I, I can do what I do. And, um, and also, you know, I just every time on, on set, everybody asked if I was, uh, my name is Amy Long, everybody asked if I was Amy Long's assistant or something uh, when I first pull up to this to the set. So that happens to me a lot. And, um, mm. but yeah, um, finally, I mean, years later, I did a couple of shorts um, um, during these, um, in the interim and, um, and um, yeah, this is my first first feature. I'm very proud of it, and um, it's a long time coming. But yeah, can I just interject? When you see both these women's films, there's no question they can direct. I mean, they're they're quite different. Robbins is comedy, and it's wonderful, and it's loaded with great characters. I I gotta say, some of the best characters, and and Amy with the suspense and the way she builds, you know, the suspense and, 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 and uh, all the little details that are in the shot. Uh, it's clear, both these women are good directors. And I think the challenges that lie not only for them, but for, you know, a lot of, a lot of women uh, in particular is, is exactly what Robin says. You have to keep proving yourself over and over again, which is, I'm sure from their end, it's got to be extremely frustrating because, you know, take a look. 
yes, they can do this. And that's part of, you know, what, what we're trying to do is showcase and say, yeah, look here, these women can direct and they do it very well. Yeah. Thank you, Cheryl. I think these, I mean, thank you for thank having you. us. I think these are, these are the kind of exposure that we want and, um, you know, to, to be able to be a part of showcasing in the, in the film festival like this, it's, it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so are there any films or filmmakers that really inspire or influence your work? Oh my God, well, I love Barry Jenkins. Um, he's one of my favorites, like contemporary filmmakers. Um, Julie Dash and like Daughters of the Dust is probably one of the reasons why I'm a filmmaker. It's an old, old movie, um, but absolutely incredible. Um, and gosh, yeah. There's so many. <laughs> Wong Kar Wai is one of my favorites, also incredible. Um, so those are, those are my top. I'm I'm with you there. Um, Wong Kar Wai <laughs> is one of the reasons I became a filmmaker. Yeah. Um, the combination of him and Christopher Doyle is just. I I wanted to be a DP in the very beginning when I started out. Mm. So that was my inspiration. And um, and um, I I was lucky enough I got to work with him for a little bit on Grandmasters in China. It was it was an incredible experience. I learned a lot. But um, yeah, that's that's one of my top ones too. Nice. Great choices. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and you know, Julie Dash, uh, Robin brought up Julie Dash. Julie Dash is a perfect example of a director that was so overlooked for so many years, you know, uh, and, and fairly recently she started to get the recognition that she deserves. But uh, there's so many directors that are like that, you know, that it's, 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 really, um, it's really a shame to bring them into the spotlight. We, you know, at Cascadia every year, this year we're not doing it because we're online, but we have a, an honored guest program. And we've had uh, our, our two honored guests, last year the honored guest was supposed to be the women's uh, suffrage movement. And uh, then of course, everything kind of fell apart with the, the pandemic, but we did showcase a film uh, that was uh, directed by uh, Katia Von Garnier called Iron Jawed Angels about that. Um, HBO had produced it, but um, uh, the previous years uh, we had selected, the first year was a, a woman by the name of Cheryl Boone Isaacs, who was uh, uh, the Academy, uh, the Motion Picture Academy um, president and first, uh, first woman of color, and I think she's only the third woman president of, of uh, the Academy. And, and uh, the second uh, honored guest was a woman named Frida Lee Mock. And Frida is a documentary filmmaker who has done tons of things for uh, women in the industry and has a distinguished career. She made the film about Anita Hill, um, speaking uh, truth to power, which is the film that we showcased. Well, actually we showcased two of her films. And Frida, both those women are fast friends of the festival now. Uh, they came and, and uh, but we were recognizing them for, for some of what they have done in terms of, of trying to uplift women and open doors for them in the industry. Uh, and they continue to do that. And I, I gotta tell you, one of the most meaningful things that occurred uh, when Frida was here, uh, she and of course she met all the directors and everything and she says to me uh, I guess she was leaving I can't remember but she said she says you know I, I was wondering what I was meant to do next here in my career and she says and you've shown me what I'm supposed to be doing and she meant by that mentoring some of these younger filmmakers and she has kept in touch we know with a number of them uh, uh, from that, that year, from that festival. So that's, that's the kind of thing that you want to see happen. Uh, other women mentoring other women and, and helping each other because that seems to be kind of what it takes at least right now, I think. I don't know, would you guys agree? Totally, 100%. Definitely. 100%, 100%, 100%. We need all the support we can get and mentoring. <laughs> I think that's so important, especially people who has, broke it into the industry. I think for me, um, for my film, um, in post, we, we were so short of money and budget and stuff. And then um, my editor happened to be working 
on a movie called On the Basis of Sex with Mini Letters. And um, that whole team, uh, they were so supportive. We ended up using one of their editing suites for a number of months. And um, Mimi was so supportive and her entire post crew. And they're all women. That, that, end up, that show, um, mm -hmm. that, that um, film, ended up having a whole entire um, female post-production crew. And that I was so proud. I was so happy to see that. Yeah. Yeah, especially in film where everything is really based off of building connections with people and being able to access those resources. I think that's really the biggest barrier that stops a lot of younger women from trying to get into it. So on that note, I wonder, Cheryl, if you from the perspective of someone who is uh, looking from planning the film festivals, what you are looking for in the films that you're watching for Cascadia mm -hmm. and if you have any advice for people to kind of elevate their work if they're mm -hmm. wanting to apply to a film festival and the process of doing that. Well, <laughs> uh, first of all, make the best film you can make under the, you know, what, you, what you've got to work with. The, the one thing you do have uh, uh, working in your favor as a filmmaker right now is the technology has gotten to be such that you can make a film, well, you know, you can make a film on your iPhone, I guess. Uh, so so uh, the technology is available, sometimes not always uh, the, you know, state of the art stuff that you, that you wanna use. And uh, as Amy mentioned, you know, in the post-production stuff, that, that gets to be a, another matter. But, um, you know, pick it up and, 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 and give it a try, but do the best, the best you can it doesn't have to be perfect it just has to be excellent um, as far as cascade i honestly um i come along in the selection process pretty late uh we have um uh, as i mentioned earlier we've got jurors that for our short film process that are based uh not just in bellingham we've got about a third in bellingham and a third in los angeles and new york uh, dc i forget where else around the country and then third internationally and they are all, um, all but maybe a couple of them are uh, in the film industry, either uh, directors of photography or directors or writers or producers or uh, film professors, scholars. It's a wide range of people. Um, and one reason we do that is because we're trying to give uh, the festival an international perspective, not just a Bellingham perspective. So we're really looking for films everywhere. And we wanna be able to show people what's going on, what women are doing, not just locally, but, or even in the United States, but internationally, if we can. So um, that's one of the things we look for. And then of course, you know, we're really looking for the excellence in, in the, you know, in the film itself. Um, you know, there's so many components. I mean, film truly is, uh, I'm sure, Amy and Robin would agree with the collaborative art. So you you know you've got the script, you've got you've got your sound, you've got your editing, you've got uh, you've got lighting. It all works together, production design to and music to you know make the final product, and, and they all have to work. Um, so when we're looking at movies, uh, I know, and a lot of times it's 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 really painful sometimes because you could tell the director knows how to direct but there's something that's just not working. Either the sound is just awful or uh, the script doesn't quite pay off or something like that. It's not that the director can't direct. You can tell they know how to handle actors, set the shots, you know? Uh, and so um, we like to encourage those people. I've written personal notes on rejection slips, which are awful. I hate, I hate the rejection stuff. Um, but you know, it's part of it's part of the business. But I'd like to be encouraging because when we see somebody that we know really has the talent there, you know, we don't want them to give up and be discouraged. I mean, I I personally used to keep a folder of rejection slips when I was submitting magazine articles around the place because it, a it kept me humble, but uh, b you know it it just reminded me that yeah okay. Everybody, there is no overnight success, first of all. I don't care what anybody says. Everybody, you know, kind of uh, goes through their, pays their dues or, or gets their, uh, their 10 years of, of experience or whatever before they make their first feature or, or whatever it is. 
And so, um, you know, I don't want people to be who submit to us and don't get in to be discouraged that, you know, just because you don't get in the first time. It may be the combination of our films. We're looking to try to keep a balance. You know, we don't want everything to be just like this year. You know, we were trying to be careful because of, of the pandemic. We didn't want everything to be so heavy um, this year because we figured everybody's pretty <laughs> heavied out. <laughs> But, but there were messages like the one, well, I mean, Robin's film is a good example because she addresses some very uh, current issues and relevant issues, but she does it in a comedic way. And the message gets crossed, you know, but it's, it's done in, in, and comedy is a lot like that. I mean, it's not comedy is, you know, often that really contains a heavier message below the surface than just what, what they're delivering. And, you know, like with Amy's film, as she said, she did it three years ago. And, and when it came into our, our radar, we thought, oh my gosh, this movie is about so much about what's going on right now. And it was so well done that we said, how can we not show this film? We, you know, we have to include this film. So, you know, we're looking at a balance of, of the mix when we're putting the, the selections together. But when it starts out, especially at the short film uh, submissions level, that, that's not a consideration. Our screeners are really looking for the quality level and can, is the director, is it a good film? Does the director put it together well? And, and that sort of thing. We have some criteria that, that, that they look at, but... Um, and it's pretty interesting. Sometimes some of the movies that we get uh, are tossed our way. We had a film this year uh, that um, the festivals were accepting. It was a feature. And we took a look at it and we said, it's just, it's just not quite there for us. And we opted for another film instead. And I'm really glad we did. I mean, not that the other film was, was terrible. It was good. But uh, there were some things that just didn't pay off, didn't quite work for us anyway. And uh, the film we ended up with, we, we feel really strongly about it. It's, we felt it was a very powerful movie. Yeah. I definitely I advice other than do the best you can and keep <laughs> at it. Yeah, what's that, what's that quote? Is it Beckett? Is it fail, uh, try again, fail again, fail better? And then, you know. Especially with film. <laughs> That's just the way it's gonna be. It's gonna be rough for a little bit. <laughs> I think it's so nice, time. Cheryl, I think it's so nice that you send actual um, feedbacks to the rejection pile, to the rejection notes, because we never get, I mean, when I get rejected, I get rejected. It's always a form, um, form response. And this says, you know, unfortunately, we can't, you know, we can't take your film this year. But thank you for doing that. I would really appreciate that. Yeah, we, we, we don't do it on everything. But, you know, I just feel like sometimes there's there's a place that, that, that you know, it, it needs to have happen. I'll tell you a quick story. One of our, um, actually one of our uh, panelists this year is a woman named Mary Lou Belly, who is a, a director, does a lot of television. And she uh, was on the DGA's uh, Women's Committee. Um, and Mary Lou uh, submitted a film to us a few years ago in the short films. And it just didn't quite work uh, for one reason or another. I can't remember exactly. And I had already, uh, when I had learned that she was on the DGA Women's Committee, a mentoring committee, I, I said, uh, would you be interested in doing a panel for us if you're in the festival? And then she got, she, she didn't make it past the first cut with our screeners. I thought, oh my God, uh, I've invited her to be on a panel. So I didn't know what to say to her. And I, so I just, I wrote her a note and I told her, well, I'm sorry, you know, but if you'd still like to be on the panel, we sure would like to have you. And um, which I thought was kind of, you know, uh, bold of me. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so I didn't hear from her. And then uh, a couple of weeks later, when we did announce our selections, she went in and she took a look at what we had chosen. And she dropped me a note and she says, I took a look at the selections that you had uh, made. And she says, I can see why my film didn't get into the festival. And uh, yes, I'd love to come be a panelist. And so she did, and she's been a friend of the festival ever since. So that's funny how things kind of work out. Yeah, and then Robin and Amy, do you two, from the perspective as filmmakers, have any advice for younger people who are trying to get into the industry in some way and for people who are trying to submit to film festivals for the first time? 
I think it's um, keep at it. Sorry. <laughs> no, go again. for it. Go for it. No, uh, I think it's just keep at it. And there's going to be so many rejections and there's going to be so many different reasons for these rejections and that we would not know where for one way, one way or the other. But um, I think it's really to just keep going. You know you if you're making a short it has to partner with a feature generally or it has to be in a shorts program that then so that they can create a program so it has to fit in with other films so there's so many components and then it just sort of reminds me of like when I was um you know in, in New York early days trying to be an actor and someone gave me advice of like oh you know you might walk in and, and the casting person you remind the casting person of like the, the person that bullied them in sixth grade <laughs> and that's why you didn't get the job and so you just you just never know you know you just have to keep trying not to take it personal it's hard um trying to take it personal um and keep making art and then in terms of like your filmmaking skills and and things of that nature um I would say watch so much and learn what you like and what you don't like and why you you don't like it and why you like it um, because I think eventually, you know, you have to, as an artist, you, ha you start off sort of imitating your heroes and then, or sheroes, and then you have to find your own voice and your own creative eye. Um, and that takes practice, but knowing what you like, um, cause now like a sort of, I watch TV, episodic TV and, and see what are people doing that's really different and unique because it is television, right? And so, you know, people don't expect it to always be cinematic, but there are those directors there. Like, for example, one of my favorite TV directors is Karen Kusama. Um, if you don't know her, she's also a filmmaker, a director. Um, but, you know, she did an episode of Outsiders and I, and I didn't know that it was her episode and I watched it and I was like, what? What? The coffee cup? Like, what? This episode is so fire. And then I looked and I was like, oh, of course. Like, yeah. it's Karen. <laughs> and that's why it's so good. So, you know, having your own style and your own flair, um, and you can only do so much when you're doing television because, you know, it is a show and, it's, you know, they have a vibe too, but, you know, you still can, you can find your way to bring, bring your own unique, your own unique style to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, I think what Robin and Amy both said is so important about, and it's so hard for artists, I mean, not taking it personally, because I mean, as an artist, and no matter whether you're a, you're a writer, actor, director, or photographer, what you're putting yourself out there and your art and you're so vulnerable because it means so much to you and you've poured your heart and soul into it. You know, I mean, I, you know, I haven't been a professional photographer. I mean, I know I know how this feels and it's just you just feel, oh, I don't know. But you know, you, you've got to kind of put that aside because as Robin said, you can't really second guess sometimes why a festival hasn't accepted your film. There's a myriad of reasons it could, could happen. I mean, you could have another film that's just a similar or something, you know, who knows. But, uh, and, and just, to, just to keep, be persistent, uh, as hard as that, that is to do, that's probably the best piece of advice. And I would say if you're a director or a writer even for films, watch movies, watch lots and lots and lots of movies. Yeah, I, I ask that question about advice for younger filmmakers a lot, and that's probably the thing I hear the most. Watch a lot of movies, <laughs> yeah. which makes me feel good, because then when I'm just sitting on my couch watching movies, I'm like, this is not important. But you, could, you learn from the bad ones as well as the good ones, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and read scripts yeah. too. You know, I think it's like, if you want to write, like the most important thing is learning how good writers write. I mean, learning how to express a, a visual language is, is it's really hard. <laughs> yeah. And the people who do it well, do it really, really, really well. Um, and it's super important to read scripts too. And I would I put a plug in for us on that because as part of the festival, one of the things we do is something called the script studio. It's become one of our most popular parts of the festival in, in the live event. And we selected by submission four short film scripts, which we did again this year, directed by women. And uh, this year, because of COVID, uh, we've recorded the readings. And typically we have actors who read live 
for, for the directors at the script studio. And we have a panel of, of film professionals who then talk with the writer afterwards about what, what works, what doesn't work. And uh, we've got a super panel. In fact, Mary Lou Belly, who I mentioned earlier, is one of the panelists this year. And it's been, uh, we've had other directors who, who come to the festival, who go to the script studio, and they said it's, it's so instructive. They, they said even, even they have gotten a lot out of it and our audiences learn because audiences, I think a lot, I don't know, a lot of people don't really know how all this stuff is put together. And they learn a lot about what it takes to make a good script. And um, anyway, we're, we're proud of that because we've had a number of, of scripts that's come out of the script studio that have gone on to have films and get in festivals. And so that's, and that, that's open to the public and, and free. And we're gonna do two sessions this year because of the online thing on a Saturday and Sunday, the Saturday the 15th and Sunday the 16th. And uh, the link to it, it'll be a Zoom webinar and it'll be available through our website. So anybody listening to this or seeing this podcast that is interested in, in script writing or anything of that sort, you wanna go to that because you're gonna learn a lot. Yeah, so the online version of Cascadia is happening this weekend. So. Can you just tell everybody how people can see that? Yeah, well, so they can go to our website, uh, CascadiaFilmFest.org. Everything is there, uh, the schedule. Uh, you can go to our virtual page and, and see. We have, uh, you know, the passes are on sale. The festival opened uh, yesterday, uh, Thursday, and it'll be running through uh, the 22nd. And we have 12 different film programs of 27 films. So uh, you can choose to uh, buy a, an all access pass, which will give you uh, access to all of the films, all of the interviews, all of the panel discussions, Q and A's, uh, the virtual festival lobbies, which we are doing this year where people can come together. Um, we have uh, four of them set up uh, during throughout the festival where people can just sign on through Zoom. And if they wanna ask a question about a film or get uh, you know somebody's uh, thoughts about what they thought of a film, maybe some of our directors will drop by and, and talk a little bit about it. Uh, you'll have the opportunity to do that just like you do in a, in a uh, real lobby situation. And um, then we also have uh, the um, student passes, so it's a little less expensive, but the students get access to all the films and, and the interviews, so that they should take advantage of that. And, or you can select individual programs. If you don't think you have time to see all 12 programs or won't get them all and you wanna see a couple of films, like you wanna see Amy's film, you can go in and you can select it, uh, which is something new this year. We, uh, it's, it, the online thing has changed a lot of things for us this year. And, and uh, we're, you know, we've really worked hard to make, try to make it a good experience for the filmmakers as much as we can. We're doing some virtual events with them to try to simulate and create some of the same things that would happen if they were here. Um, it's not quite the same, but, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the new world. Um, and uh, for our audience to make it easy for them to order. I think, it's, I think the platform work, works great. It's really easy. I heard from a couple of people today very easy to go in and see what the films are about, choose the films. And um, we've got a couple of how-to videos if you don't know how to get them onto your big screen, uh, we've got that uh, covered. And, and then every day you're gonna get an update, a daily digest telling you what is going on that day, what interview you have access to or uh, uh, what film we can suggest. So there's a, there's a lot happening even though it's online. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you all so much for talking with me today. Thank, thank you for you having, having me. Us. That's been great, Raven. And, and I, I got to especially thank Robin and Amy for taking time for their busy schedule because uh, we know their time is valuable. And, and thank you for ha having all of us and, and talking about women and movies. Yeah, it was great to talk to you all and great to meet you too, Robin and Amy. Thank All you right. for having Thank us. Thank you so much.